Today, I have the distinct pleasure welcoming on the show Nicole Hatcher, who is a physician assistant, personal finance expert, and a YouTuber, a website owner, and a personal friend of mine because we're actually in a kind of a mastermind group of blog owners together. So, uh, Nicole, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for inviting me, Travis. I'm really honored, and thank you so much for that introduction. Frugal Chic Life, that's uh, Frugal Chic, C H I C L I F E dot com. That's your website. Maybe if you could just start off telling our listeners, your physician assistant, your personal finance expert, but we'll start off with personal finance. Like, how did you get into personal finance? And, you know, when did you get interested in what money could do in your life? Wow. I don't know. It goes all the way back, like to the beginning. As long as I can recall, I've always been interested in money. And interesting fact, I've been called cheap pretty much all my life, which I've always told people I'm not cheap, I'm frugal. And that's kind of like when I started my brand, I knew I had to have frugal in the title (laughs) because I've been explaining to people the distinction between the two for so many years. But goes all the way back to my childhood. I just always have been really selective with what I did with my money. I always wanted to save and prioritize for things that I wanted to purchase. And I never wanted to be in a situation where I wanted something and couldn't get it because I did not have the financial resources for it. So it goes all the way back to the beginning. And I really consider myself like a money nerd. And I think I'm just a regular everyday person. I guess I take on that title of expert if somebody wants to give it to me. But I really say I'm just like an everyday person who just really likes everything money. Well, like your YouTube channel has tens of thousands of subscribers. So I, I feel like you're kind of an expert in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. In terms of money, like was it the feeling of not having enough growing up? Like what kind of you know relationship with money did your parents have and, and how did that affect you? Yeah. So yeah, I would say a lot of how I relate to money now obviously is, re- is linked to how I grew up. I mean, my parents were teenage parents. So I guess just starting there, like They didn't necessarily have the most optimal start to their adult lives. They had to figure out how to be adults really on the fly as they were still kids. So my mother got pregnant with me at the age of 16 and gave birth to me after she turned 17. Them starting out so young, they were just trying to figure it out for themselves. So naturally, that impacted the rest of their lives after that of now having to figure out how to be adults, how to now raise this child and get out into actual real life and start living on their own because up until this point, they were both living individually with their own parents. So it was several years later when my parents actually eventually got married and we all you know, moved into the same house. I was like maybe four or five years old at the time once we were actually all under the same roof you know, as a family. Those early years were you know, pretty tough. Both of my parents were more, more or less working class people And my father did a little bit of college, but eventually didn't finish, had to really focus on earning and earning a a living for himself and now for this wife and kid that he has. And then shortly thereafter, my sister came as well. So, you know, they had to kind of figure it out. So there were a lot of really lean years early on. And then a few years later, my parents eventually divorced. And then my mother had to figure out how I'm going to do this, you know, on my own as a single parent. Now with these two kids that I have to take care of and be the primary earner for them. So absolutely, all of that shaped who I am today. There's no getting past that. That's so interesting. So do you think that the frugality, did that come more for your mom or from your dad? I'd say probably more from my from my mother. I don't necessarily know that my father was that frugal, but definitely during those those lean years, especially after her and my father separated and then subsequently divorced, those lean times, you know, I saw her clipping coupons. I saw her looking through the sales paper and shopping through the stores for the things that were the least expensive. You know, I saw her stocking up on toilet paper, toothpaste, household products because when she had the cash, because there might come a time when she didn't necessarily have as much extra cash. I also think I get a lot of my hustle from my mother because, you know, she was like the original side hustler. So after her and my father separated, she worked a full time day job then got a second job at night. She actually delivered pizzas, which I know she hated. She really, really hated it. But she took on a second job delivering pizza uh, so that she could be able to afford the bills now on her own as a single mother to take care of myself and my sister. So absolutely, I think my mother is really where I see, you know, those traits coming from. You know, like a lot of people I think have been talking about privilege, like with the protests happening around the country right now a lot just because of, I mean, it's really focused a lot of people's attention on it. And that's 
kind of a wonderful example of that because, you know, I mean, at 22, I was going to college parties and not having a care in the world. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And your mom was like, you know, having to be an adult very, very fast and then kind of raise two children. It makes sense why you're frugal after, you know, having kind of like that difficult of a life growing up, right? Yeah. You know, at the time, I think it seemed sort of normal for me. I don't feel like I was ever at a place where I was deprived of things or there were things that I could never get. I saw my mother save for things. I saw her, they used to have layaway. I think they still have layaway at certain stores, but you would go and, you know, pick up your Christmas items that you wanted in September, put a down payment on, say, these are the things I want and make payments on it. Uh, you know, no interest or anything, but you just incrementally pay off the balance. And then here comes December and you have all of your Christmas gifts. I saw her do that for stuff like furniture. So she always made a way to get the things that she wanted. She just had a plan to go along with it. So I think at the time, I didn't really feel like I was deprived. Definitely looking back, I know those lean times impacted me now. But as a child, you're really resilient. And you, at least I, I feel like I was. And I don't feel like it at the moment I felt deprived going through the situation, but later today as an adult, it absolutely has shaped who I am now and how I strive to take care of my family as well now. It's kind of interesting because we had similar reasons for becoming frugal at young ages, although mine was like different, I guess, in the way that it affected me career-wise. So I'm going to ask you about how that frugality like impacted your decision to become a PA here in a second. So I guess for me, I kind of saw my parents not have very much money and like whenever we would go out to eat, it was always like, you know, tell them you're 12 so we can eat off the kid's menu even though you're 14. You know, <laughs> you're not getting anything but water. And, you know, when you go out to eat, it's like a rare thing, you know, and now I go out to eat like all the time and it's so different. I saw my parents being involved in professions and kind of not ha being super happy sometimes because of that, just because like they had very low income. Like my dad was the only income earner. My mom like got laid off because yeah, because of health problems back in the day. Uh, and I was like, wow, this is not like having a profession. Not as all it's cracked up to be, I guess, in my mind. And so I kind of looked at my granddad who invested in everything as, as like, wow, that's a really cool way to not be stuck in a profession, you know? So I kind of like actively fought the idea of being a professional of some sort, like a defined professional. I'm just kind of curious, like you becoming a physician assistant, like how, I guess, how much of that was wanting to be a P? Because I, I, you know, whenever you ask a kid what they want to be when they grow up, right? It's like, doctor, firefighter, like nurse, astronaut, like, you know, it's like, you know, not a lot of people say PA because like most people I don't think understand that it exists until they're older. How did you decide to be a PA and how much of that decision was brought on by like financial insecurity when you were a child? Mm -hmm. I didn't grow up saying I wanted to be a PA. I had no idea what, what a PA was until I was already in college. But I did, in fact, decide that I wanted to go into healthcare, And it was specifically because I wanted a high earning job. I wanted a high income career. So I specifically said, you know what, let me look at these careers. I literally went to the library, took out books like we <laughs> did back in the day, actual libraries, and went to the library and started looking through the career section. And I, I landed on medicine. And so I was like, hmm, I'm going to do something in the healthcare field. And so I bounced back and forth trying to decide what it is I wanted to do. And I said, OK, I'm going to be a doctor. So all throughout sort of like high school, I bounced back and forth between like wanting to be a pharmacist and then the idea of becoming a medical doctor. And actually, if you look at my high school yearbook, it actually says where you list your career, what you want to do, it says pharmacist, because that's where I was at that particular time in my life. And when I decided to register for college, I enrolled as initially a chemistry major for like five minutes. And then I switched it over to biology with the intent of becoming a, a medical doctor one day. But at the time, I was also working a retail job part time while I was in school. And one of my coworkers, her sister was actually in school to be a PA. And she came into the store that we worked in. It was a clothing store. And she introduced her sister, my coworker. And she said, you know, I'm in school to be a PA. And I'm like, oh, it's a PA. And then that got the wheel sort of turning in my head about this idea of going to school to become a PA. I had never heard of it before. And once I started doing some more research, again, hopping on the library, <laughs> in the library and on the computer at the time, I was able to find some information. And I was like, hmm, this might be the perfect kind of segue into a career in medicine without having to go to medical school uh, for four years and then do a three or four year residency or fellowship 
And maybe I can just get out into the workforce and start to earn some income without having to necessarily sacrifice so many years of my life in order to get there and achieve that education. And so that's sort of how I arrived to that point. And I said, this is a great career profession that would allow me to also have flexibility as well. And I thought that I might not have as much of that flexibility going into a career as a medical doctor. Interesting. So PA was kind of like this nice medium of higher pay, more challenging work, but also more flexible to give you kind of more options in life for what you wanted. Absolutely. As I started to research it, you know, when you are a medical doctor, you decide on, you have four years of medical school and then you take, you go on different rotations and then you have to declare what you want to specialize in and do a residency there. And then from that point, once you complete that residency, you're almost sort of stuck in that profession. So if I decided I wanted to be a dermatologist and then I get into it, I complete that residency and I don't like being a dermatologist, you don't really see too many dermatologists going back to residency to become surgeons or to become emergency medicine doctors. Once you're there, you've put in all that time and energy and you can't really change specialties. But as a PA, I have worked in urgent care I've worked in the emergency room. I've worked in internal medicine, cardiology. I've worked in inpatient, outpatient, and now I actually work in psychiatry. So one of the great things that I liked about being a PA was that I did not have to say, oh, I want to be an emergency medicine PA for the rest of my life. I have the opportunity to go and work in a different area of medicine if I so choose. So that was really compelling to me. It was really intriguing. And I said, okay, this might be a great thing. I knew I wanted to have kids one day. And I thought that I would be able to have that flexibility and it would help my family as well. That's great. So let's talk a little bit about becoming a PA. When you found out that you wanted to be a PA or you were going to be interested in that, I looked online, like a lot of the PA programs are like two and three year programs. Is that kind of accurate? Yes. So what does that look like becoming a PA from bachelor's degree to actually being out in the workforce as a PA? So it actually looks very different today than it did when I actually graduated. So I graduated undergrad in 2003. So I've been a practicing PA since, let's see, I finished December 2003, did my studies for my boards and then passed my boards February of 2004 and then got my license from there. So I've been out in the workforce for a long time, but the PA profession is actually like a baby when you when you think about it in terms of other professions. It's only been around since the 60s. So it actually started out as a certificate program. There was never even a degree associated with it. And it came out of this idea of there being a physician shortage. And we have to find some way to bridge this gap with this upcoming physician shortage. And so they took U.S. Navy corpsmen who had been doing a lot of medical procedures in the Navy and they trained them. And that was actually the first class of PAs um, out of Duke University, I believe. So that's how the profession really evolved. But of course, over time, you get this degree creep. So it went from a certificate to a bachelor's program. Now, the vast majority of PA programs are master's. I don't know of any programs that are strictly bachelor's anymore. But at the time, when I was looking to go into PA school, it was about maybe 60, 40, about 60% of them were at the master's level and there were still about 40% offering bachelors. So I actually was already working towards my bachelor's in biology at a school in Baltimore from Baltimore, Maryland. They did not offer a PA program. So I started to look at other schools and there was a school in DC. And so I transferred. My undergrad degree is as a PA. So when I graduated PA school, I was 22 years old. I came out really, really young. Wow. Yeah. And so nowadays you see a lot of PAs maybe coming out, you know, now that it's a master's degree, not many are coming out at 22 as a certified PA. You're, you know, 24, 25, what have you, maybe a little bit older. But in my class, I was sort of the minority in that most of my classmates were second career individuals. They had other careers in other fields and then came back and decided uh, to be a PA after being in the military, or we had a respiratory therapist in my class, people that had done lots of other things and then made that transition. So my entry into the PA profession was a bit different than probably your average person coming out of PA school now, where pretty much 100% of the programs are all now master's degrees. And that obviously impacts the amount of tuition programs can charge and how much people come out of school with student loan debt too. Yeah, that is really interesting. So what would you say is the breakdown between two and three-year programs? Like how many places are two-year, how many places are three-year master's? I don't know any that are just two. Most of them are two and a half to three, depending on how they're structured. It really varies depending on a lot of different factors. 
of course, like you have an accrediting body that dictates what types of things you need to teach. And you have to have a minimum number of months in the program. Most of them are about two and a half years, I would say. Interesting. So that would be, what is the typical cost? Like 20000 for tuition per year? I mean, I know it ranges, but is that kind of, you know, you have maybe 20000 for tuition, 20000 living expenses, like forty grand a year? Or like, what does that cost range look like? Now, I have no idea. I eventually, after graduating, started precepting students and I actually taught at a PA program for a while and interacting with students, working in the clinics and stuff, I would supervise students. And I would talk to these, like I say, kids, and they're coming out of school with these massive amounts of debt from PA school. I had one student say, oh, yeah, from between undergrad and the, and the PA program, the master's program, I'm going to have about $150,000 worth of debt. And looking at my story, I came out of school with a bachelor's degree and was able to practice as a PA. And I had about $30,000 of debt from that particular degree. So looking at $30,000 coming out of school in December 2003, to fast forward to today, people are coming out with the amount that I thought I would have had going to medical school back in the day. So it really kind of blows my mind how that degree creep has now impacted people so much to the point where they are coming out with six figures of debt. Now, to put a pin there, I did eventually accumulate six figures or just under six figures of debt, (laughs) but (laughs) not just from going to school to be a PA. I went on to get a master's degree. And also I wanted to earn a doctorate before the age of 30. Don't ask me how I came up with that arbitrary number, but 30 it was. And I worked hard to get to that point where I could earn that degree. And at that point, I had just under six figures, just under 100K and student loan debt from those three degrees combined. But certainly, had I continued to just practice as a PA and not pursue the additional education, you get grandfathered in. So nobody would have said, okay, Nicole, you only have a bachelor's degree. You got to go back to school and get that master's. You know, nobody would have come to me with that rule because you get grandfathered in. I worked with PAs who came out of school in the 70s, and they were practicing with certificate degrees. They didn't have bachelor's degrees. So you get grandfathered in, but I wanted to do other things and advance my education. And so that's why I went back and got two additional degrees and subsequently ended up in all that student loan debt. That's so fascinating because a lot of people will say like, how can we not have our you know physical therapist with doctorate degrees or something? But it's like, well, wait a second. We had PAs, physical therapists, pharmacists for a long time, and it's not like they did a terrible job with the degrees that they had, right? Like, I mean, I don't know, like, how much do you think that you would have been impacted positively if you had been, you know, having to go through a master's degree versus your background as a bachelor's degree? Like, do you think it would have made a difference at all? No, not at all. Yeah. Yeah, clinically, there's no difference. Everybody sits for the same exact test and gets licensed Uh, We get certified nationally after passing the national boards, and then you apply for a license in each individual state that you work in. And so there's no difference. We all sit for the same exam is no different exam because somebody came out with a bachelor's degree versus a master's degree. But now those programs are no more. As far as I know, no more strictly bachelor's degrees. All of them have transitioned to the place where they're offering a master's. And I think a lot of it obviously has to do with being able to charge a whole lot more for someone's education because we're putting this master's degree stamp on it. The curriculum is almost completely identical. Some programs do a little more emphasize like research or uh, a big project at the end to meet that graduate criteria, but clinically it makes no difference. So it really is interesting how that transition has came about. And for myself, I wondered if I came out of school today, would I have even considered going to PA school knowing I was going to come out with $160,000, $180,000 of debt? Why not just at that point go to medical school then? You know, would be my question. Well, yeah. I mean, kind of my blood is boiling a little bit because I know <laughs> like the reason for this, like the schools are like the enablers. They're like, you know, they're the whispers, right? They're like, you know, you need to get more education. Like you want a doctor, you don't want a master's, right? Like they're the ones that's like pushing it behind the scenes hard. Absolutely. And then like the profession, it's kind of like, well, you're, you know, a bachelor's degree holder and it's kind of like, you, okay, you're going to make the same money or more if you let us have this new credential requirement. 
and you're going to have a harder time for like new kids to come into the profession and like lower your wages from like other people competing with you. Right. You know, those people that got grandfathered in, they're like, you know, your natural reaction, I think, would be like, I don't care. Right. I mean, like, you know, if you raise the credential requirement, as long as I don't get affected, like, go ahead. Right. Right. I mean, it's certainly that way, like for like chartered financial analysts and stuff like they have like new requirements, I think, for people who have not yet done it. And it's kind of like, you know, oh, it's harder to become one. And like, it makes the credential look better. And like, I don't have to do it. Sign me up, you know? (laughs) So like, you know, you have the power brokers in the profession that like don't necessarily oppose it. And so like the only people that would potentially oppose it would be like students who haven't gone through it yet. But then also we're taught so much to like value education. So I don't know, like just listening to you tell us this, Nicole, I'm kind of feeling like we need some sort of like degree creep, like national law to like roll some of this back. I mean, I don't know what that looked like, but what do you think about that? I have no idea what it would look like now. I think people are too invested in it now (laughs) and people have spent so much money on their education. Yeah, they'd be mad, right? People would absolutely be mad, but I totally agree that in, in certain fields, it definitely impacts the type of candidates that you get. I think it makes it more difficult to have a more diverse PA population. For example, we already struggle with the diversity piece anyway. You know, and then it also has that additional burden of all that additional student loan. And when you come out of school, that impacts your decision to take one job over another. Maybe one person wants to work in a medically underserved community, but they know they have this six figures of debt that they have to pay back. And so they're like, I need to go for the high paced 80 hour a week surgical PA job where I am helping the cardiac surgeons do heart transplants and all that kind of stuff. But maybe they really wanted to work in an underserved community, but they could not afford to take that job, maybe earning less because they have to pay back this whole large burden of student loan debt that they had to accrue to get out of school. Yeah, well, I mean, and also our our loan forgiveness programs are totally messed up because we could reward those people that go into those fields by just like giving them, you know, a certain amount of money every year for serving those fields. But instead, you know, one of the problems with the public service loan forgiveness program is a PA that works at like some fancy rich hospital gets like loan forgiveness on their 180,000 after 10 years of service there, right? That person's going to get, you know, tax-free loan forgiveness on majority of their debt. Whereas that person that's working in, you know, maybe a private clinic in an underserved area doing like primary care type work doesn't get anything. And it's just not a rational system. Yeah. They make you jump through so many hoops from what I understand. I never actually looked into student loan forgiveness But from what I hear, they make you jump through so many hoops. And like you said, it's not necessarily benefiting the people that you think that the programs were created to benefit. It's really kind of warped. And it actually goes against the whole idea of creating primary care PAs to fill this shortage of primary care physicians. When the profession was created back in the 60s, that was the whole idea. We have this shortage specifically of primary care doctors. And now PAs are being pretty much lured into more into specialties where you bring in where you make more money because they have these big bills that they have to pay for now as far as student loan debt and lifestyle creep as well. Well, I will say this. So our average PA has about 180,000 of student loan debt of our client group. So that's a big range. Like we see people that, you know, 120,000 kind of in-state public program and then, you know, 250,000 that went to like, you know, one of the schools in DC, right? That with the high rent and everything they had to pay while they're in school. Like the typical PA salary what would you say? Is it like, you know, 90 to 150? Like, is that a fair range? Or, you know, what are you seeing out there for like new grads? I haven't looked at the data in a while. I do know the American Academy of PAs, they do a survey every single year where they break it down by state, by specialty. And it really is a very detailed report. So I don't want to misquote, but I would say 90s, 90,000 and up. And the higher salaries are usually for those surgical specialties or emergency medicine. So I would say that's a that's definitely a fair range. When I was working as PA faculty, I had students coming out, they would come to faculty and say, can you look at my contract? Because they have no idea how to read a contract. And as faculty, we would kind of sort of give them some guidance, but of course say, hey, have a lawyer look at this, but this is what you should look for in a PA employment contract, because you don't want to just sign your life away for the next three years and be locked into a particular company. And you know mm-hmm. they haven't given you what you deserve. But I would look at these contracts and some of my students were coming out with offers of 110000 right out of school. So it really varies depending on the, the area of practice, the geographic area, as well as the subspecialty. So, Yeah. Well, so one fascinating thing we do is survey sometimes of student loan refinancing 
uh, every year or so. And, and one of the things we found in this latest survey, we asked, what is your field in you know, digital refinance? PAs have one of the highest percentages of people that are pursuing paying back their debt versus using forgiveness, which I think is really interesting because you know you chose PA field because of the it's a good field and there's high incomes, right? So mm-hmm. you get the kind of high incomes, you know, maybe not super dissimilar from like a pediatrician in some cases in terms of your pay. Exactly. And then, you know, you also have that two and a half year level of debt, which, you know, especially if you're looking kind of in the past of what people borrowed, maybe 150-ish kind of is a probably an average. So that debt to income ratio is below 1.5, I think, for your typical PA. And that's actually the threshold for when refinancing makes sense, Mm -hmm. unless you're pursuing forgiveness, like the public service loan forgiveness. So I would imagine that there's more PAs in private practice than physicians. Would that be accurate or is that not true? Do you happen to know that? I don't actually. But it's common for PAs to be in private practice, right? Yeah. As that shift has happened though, and folks have started to move more towards the specialties, those are usually more hospital-based jobs. So Mm. traditionally, I would say yes. That was really the format that we were trained in as being in like a community-based model. But now the jobs are shifting, I think, more towards the hospital-based setting. So I think that shift has also came along with salary increases as well. And you can have a little more control over your over your salary, I think, in a major healthcare system where they do the market research and you know exactly how they are basing your salary versus getting a job offer from a private doctor that you're working with and they just pick some arbitrary number that they want to pay you, not really based on any real market research. Yeah. So, I mean, so to, to kind of shift the discussion a little bit, so like you said earlier in the, in the PA field, it's a field that very much struggles with diversity of the people that practice it. According to the AAPA I looked up, only 2.7% of the PA field is African American and the PA field overall is 88% white. So, you know, as an African American like physician assistant, why do you think that the field is so white? Is it systemic racism? Is it the field doesn't welcome underrepresented minorities? Is it you know these arbitrary degree creep things they're doing? Like what what is the the thing that's holding the field back from representing what the population of America looks like? I'd say all of the above, pretty much. You just summed it right up perfectly. I'd say all of the above. And additionally, it's just a reflection of the medical community at large. So if you look at doctors, there's a much smaller percentage of those that are minorities and specifically African-American. And then if you break it down to women, it's an even smaller number. So I think it, it's just a reflection of the medical community at large. I also think that programs aren't necessarily prioritizing promoting the profession within minority schools or communities. I do think they are doing a better job now in 2020 than they were in 2000, 2001 when I was applying. So it's been a long time. But they are making more efforts now to actively recruit in minority communities. But I would say there's always room for improvement. And then there are very few HBCUs that still have PA programs. It was always a very small number. I graduated from one of the oldest programs in the country as far as HBCUs. That program has now subsequently closed. And I believe right now, as of today, there's only one HBCU that that has a PA program. At the most, it's two. That's terrible. I do too. I think it's it's horrible. The program that I graduated from, I heard a stat some years ago that said that they graduated something like 40% of the minority PAs in the country that were practicing around that time. Either way, it's a really, really large number. And to lose those programs where you already have that diverse population, I think it's a, it's a travesty. I think that opening up more programs at uh, HBCUs should definitely be on the agenda for the profession. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to ask a, a point about that here in a second. Like, if you're comfortable sharing, you know, when's the first time you experienced racism or bias against you as, as a professional because of uh, your skin color? Mm-hmm. So to give a little bit of context, I grew up in, I already said I grew up in Baltimore City. And I grew up in Baltimore City at a time before it was gentrified and before it was a cool sort of hipster place you know, for white people to live. It was pretty much all black in my neighborhood. Went to all black public schools all the way through high school. Subsequently went to an HBCU in Baltimore, found out about the PA profession, transferred to another HBCU in Washington, D.C. And up until that point, I had not honestly interacted with a lot of people outside of my race. Of course, I knew I was black, but I was always around other black people for the most part. Once I really made that transition into the workforce was when I started to have those interactions 
really as a professional and just as a person in general. My husband and I got married shortly after undergrad and moved from the Maryland area to Michigan. Nothing against anybody that lives in Michigan. I'm not saying Michigan is bad, but I had some some really horrible... Travis, you're not from Michigan, are you? <laughs> I'm in St. Louis, but I grew up in Florida. So, you know, <laughs> you could you can trash Michigan and go ahead, you know? I mean, <laughs> so apologies to anybody uh, who's from Michigan. Nothing against anybody from Michigan, but I had some really, really bad experiences there. And I could tell you, I was not in a minority-friendly area. I wasn't in some place where there are a lot of brown, brown and black people like Detroit, Funny enough, when I told my family I was moving to Michigan, everybody always said, they call me Nikki. Nikki, you know, she moved up to Detroit. And I'm like, I don't live anywhere near Detroit. Like, whenever they thought Michigan, (laughs) and they're like, oh, I know it's some Black people in Detroit. They they said, Nikki's up in Detroit. And I'm like, I was nowhere near Detroit. But (laughs) once, once we made that transition to living in Michigan... Shortly after I had passed my boards, I was able to get a license. So we, we got married. We moved to Michigan. And it was really during those first round of interviews as I started to look for jobs as a PA for the first time, newly fresh out of school and going into some of those interviews. And I would just see people's faces. I mean, my name's Nicole Hatcher. Hatcher's my married name. And on a resume, that's sort of a racially neutral name. Nobody's going to look at Nicole Hatcher and really know whether I'm black, I'm white, or what have you, is sort of a, a neutral name. So I would have my resume go through, and I would get calls back, and I would see that look on people's faces when they saw that it was me. I was young. I was definitely black and definitely a woman. So it was kind of that look. I would sit down and in, in seconds know that I had no chance of getting this job. And I've even had interviewers go as far as to Caucasian interviewers on those first early interviews, ask me if I was going to be comfortable working with white people. The question just blew me away. It just, I had never, I couldn't even fathom the idea of somebody asking me a question like that on an interview. That's crazy. It really like, was crazy. Are you comfortable having a black colleague? Uh, right. You know, yeah, like... That speaks more to your issue than it would to mine, that you're asking that question. You know what yeah. I mean? So that that was my thought at the time. But sitting down after going on these interviews, interview after interview after interview. It's hard enough as a new graduate in a new area, going on these interviews and just seeing that look of recognition in people's faces, like there's no chance of me getting this job, and but having to sit through the whole hour long interview anyway, walking out knowing that I would never get a call back. So that right there was like my first entry into it. And then from there, going into once I actually did get a job, found out I was being significantly underpaid compared to my uh, Caucasian counterparts, found that out. Subsequently left that job, went to another job and just different interactions, not just with coworkers. Sometimes I was the only black face in the room, but also with my patients. I remember one specific incident when I was working in an urgent care center, walk in the room. It was a young family, a uh, husband and wife and a little girl, Caucasian family. And the little girl said to her mom, she's like, mommy, why is her face dirty? And I reached oh, up and no. I'm thinking, I know I reached up to my face thinking like, maybe I got some food on my face from lunch. Like, what's up? And then I realized what she was saying. Like, she had never seen a black person before. Do you think that's the parents or do you think that's the kids like unconscious programming or like? The kid was like five, you know, kids say the darndest things. You know, I don't think she meant anything negative by it, but she had never been exposed to a black person, which I thought was was kind of crazy. But then looking back on it myself, growing up around all black people, we knew that there were white people out there. So it was just kind of a a situation where I was just kind of struck. I didn't know what to say. So I basically just shifted the conversation and moved back on to her ear infection or whatever it was she was there for. for. But I think that's, you know, a five-year-old, she doesn't know any better. But the parents looked like they wanted to melt into the floor. They were so embarrassed that she said that. At least that was their reaction versus like, I don't know. Like, you exactly. know, like, like they seemed genuinely embarrassed that she said that. We all had the realization like at the same time what she was saying. <laughs> that was one of my first introduction. And then over the years, you know, still still working in Michigan. My husband uh, went to graduate school up there. So we were there for a good two and a half years. I've had patients refuse to be treated because they uh, refuse treatment because they didn't want to be treated by a black person. In that particular day, it actually happened to be a Black doctor on duty, myself, Black PA, and a Black charge nurse, which was like a perfect storm because all three of us, we were like the three, were rarely ever like working the same shift at the same time. And it just happened that we were all three there. And the patient saw me and said, well, I don't want to be treated. I said, okay, let me let you talk to my doctor. Doctor goes in, up. Black doctor, I don't want to be treated. Okay, well, I'm going to send in the charge nurse with the AMA papers, the Against Medical Advice papers. You sign yourself out. 
And then the black nurse came in with the AMA papers and the patient refused to sign them and then left, you know, so, oh, wow. Wow. so, so, so stuff like that. I've been told to go back to Africa. And I always say, I'm not, I'm not from Africa. I'm, I'm from Baltimore. Just crazy stuff that you feel like you shouldn't have to deal with as a human being. But I developed a tough skin over time. And then as we transition back to more of the Maryland area, it's more of the subtleties than overt racism, I would say. Yeah. Like I've been listening to a lot of like old Chappelle stand up because, you know, he did his 846 special like on YouTube and it kind of got me or many, you know, I like I miss watching like Chappelle like stuff. So I, I went back and listened to some stuff. And one of the things he said in one of his stand up shows was like, isn't it great when you just the racism is just super overt and out there, and you know, it's racism and it's obvious, like it's just called out like, you know, he kind of like he was kind of doing a, a take about Mississippi racism is like super like everybody agrees. Yeah, that's racism. But then there's that like subtle racism that you were kind of talking about how it's like more subtle where you're at there. And that's racism, too. But like people don't want to like kind of admit it or people get super defensive. Exactly. What are your experiences with that? Like, you know, people, oh, I'm, I'm not a racist or like they say some sort of like thing that kind of like protects them, you know, emotionally from feeling like they're a racist. Oh, right. Like, like saying they have one black, I have one black friend or the person that cuts my grass is black or something like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, in terms of like the overt, like obvious racism versus like the weird looks that you got in interviews, like which one of those makes you feel more, feel more uncomfortable and, and why? Hmm. I mean, they all make me feel uncomfortable, but I would definitely yeah. say that the overt racism is easier to kind of swallow. Honestly, I know who you are. You know who you are. You know who I am. Uh -huh. And we just going to keep it moving versus yeah. the person that is like, OK, I'm really a racist. But, you know, I know politically I'm not supposed to say these types of things in interviews. So I'm just going to make these little tiny jabs and ask these little things here to let you know that I know you know, who you are and I know who I am too. So I would say personally, it's easier to sort of swallow with that person that just stands firmly. And if that's you, then, hey, rock with that versus the person that is not really a racist or goes out of their way to, to explain to you that they're not a racist, but their actions speak something totally different. Yeah. I mean, like there's, you know, one kind of interesting thing to, is like the different kinds of discrimination based off different things. Like, so for example, my wife's Asian American and she's had situations where she'll like her like MA, like medical assistant will go in a room and like she'll be in the room and like the patient will look at the medical assistant and they they'll be like, does she speak English? And, oh, wow. um, and yeah. And so she's definitely sometimes been like wanting to say, of course, I speak English. You am ever I'm speaking a hell of a lot better <laughs> than you, you know, probably barely can, you know, have a ninth grade reading level and like, you know, I don't know, you know what I mean? Like you want to kind of like get down to like where they're at. And that's mm -hmm. tough, I think for her, because she's got to go and treat the patient kind of like, exactly. You got to do your job. You got to go on and treat the racist patient. And it's you like, do. I don't know. I mean, like, but the thing is too, is like the kind of discrimination she's never experienced is people that don't think she can do the job because of that stereotype of Asian doctors, right? She comes in a room and nobody's like, oh my gosh, like my surgeon's Asian. They're not going to be able to do the surgery. It's right. almost kind of like, oh, my doctor's Asian, of course, right? And so, mm -hmm. I mean, have you talked to colleagues? Like, because also like the PA field is only like a few percent Hispanic, a few percent Asian American too. Like, have you talked mm -hmm. about like to other colleagues of different ethnic backgrounds, just like to compare your stories to theirs, just to see what kind of different kinds of discrimination you, that are faced? No, I can't really say that I've had that conversation with many colleagues yet. I've definitely been used to being the only minority on many jobs in the past, honestly, yeah. and checking the boxes. I'm a, I'm a woman and, you know, I'm a black woman. Uh, occasionally there may be a, a Asian person, but I have not had many conversations or interactions with my PA colleagues specifically to say, what have your interactions been? You know, and I do know that the profession is starting to make some strides, but at a systemic level, but at the patient level, you know, it is difficult interacting with people that you know think that you're inferior because of the way you look and they're afraid that you don't know how to do your job because of what you look like. So that is difficult to overcome. I just hope and pray that things will continue to get easier and that as my kids get older, that things will be easier for them as well. So let's talk a little bit about just student loans in the system. I'd love to get your opinion on some things. So, so I ran some numbers um, with Vice President Biden's plan for student loans um, and so I found that you could cover 
free tuition for every HBCU in America for about $2 billion a year versus his plan to make tuition free at all public colleges and universities would cost about $110 billion a year. I know that uh, obviously there's students of color at public colleges and universities, right? But like that stat you gave about you know, 40% uh, of all of the field was coming from HBCUs. Like, I mean, so here, just like, I would love to just hear your take on this. Like, this is what I was kind of thinking, like, okay, so we want the PA field to be more diverse. Everybody agrees with that, right? But you and I didn't start off on an equal playing field. My ancestors had a bunch of inheritances to pass along generation to generation. My parents were not teenage parents. They were able to buy prepaid tuition, right? So I was able to go to college like without a, a ton of debt, really any debt because of that. And then you used to be able to become a PA with a bachelor's degree and get access to this high earning field. Now you not only need to take out debt for your undergrad, now you got to go take it out for your PA school, right? Mm -hmm. So like what ways are we kind of like exacerbating the diversity problems in these medical fields by degree creep? Do you know what I mean? Like it's like now the distance between somebody that has money and doesn't have money to get to the same point in the field. Now it's worse, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I would agree with that 100 percent. And if you do want to get to that level where you have now checked those boxes to get the bachelor's, the master's and in some cases in some healthcare fields like physical therapy, like you cited the DPT, you know, you have these professional clinical doctors now. Nurse practitioners have the DNP, the doctorate of nursing practice. So it's even going towards that level as well. I definitely think it makes it more difficult for folks to get in because you don't have that head start where you have parents and grandparents that have said, oh, we covered your undergrad. All you got to do is cover your master's degree. Oh, cool. But you have now to foot the bill for all of that or figure out how to finance it because you weren't set up like that. Your family wasn't set up to set you up that way financially. You already start behind the eight ball, behind the starting lineup because you have all of these barriers just to get to undergrad. And I think additionally, because neither of my parents, my, my dad took some college classes, but didn't get beyond the first year. My mom took some community college classes, but never completed her degree either. I did not have those conversations with my parents to say, oh, help me navigate this college application or help me navigate the student loans. They had no idea. My grandfather, my, my dad's father completed a bachelor's degree, but he went back to school as an older adult who had kids. My father was a little boy when he finished school. So his college degree. And of course, school wasn't nearly as expensive as it is now back then. So I really didn't have anybody to talk to about this, about the financial side of things. And so I also think a part of it was just this desire for me to, to get out of the neighborhood that I was in, to get out of that existence and to do something different. And I saw education as my way of escape, which led me to say, okay, let me find a high paying career field that I can get out into and start making some money and get out of here. And that's what led me to to that particular profession. But it was kind of like I was on this rat race. I was in on this hamster wheel to try to out race like the insecurities that I had, the idea that I'm going to end up being a statistic or I need to prove these folks wrong. I need to prove to them that I can get out of Baltimore City, that I'm not going to be pregnant as a teen. I'm not going to be a teen mother. I'm going to get an education. I'm going to do all these other things and and change what my family tree looks like. So I felt like I had something to prove. And I honestly think that's what drove me to keep going with my education, where I could have stopped just right there at that bachelor's degree and been doing fine. I had to pursue more because I felt like I was kind of like wagging my finger at people like I made it. So you've definitely closed that gap for you and your own family, for sure. I mean, as a personal finance content creator, you know, what are your thoughts on like the broader like racial wealth gap problems? Like how how do you begin to address this? Because obviously you're not going to address it overnight because it took hundreds of years to get to this point. Right. But like what, you know, what are some thoughts? I mean, I mean, obviously you're doing a ton of work already helping other people like realize like, you know, I mean, I think you're like an amazing success story too. That's like awesome. So I don't know, like, what are your thoughts on like the racial wealth gap in America? Well, I mean, it's, it's overwhelming just thinking about it. I, I saw a statistic recently that said it's going to take about 228 years for Black families to bridge that racial wealth gap to get to the same level of family net worth that white families have. And I knew it was a huge number because, you know, you, you have to take into account all of those years being oppressed through slavery, then subsequent Jim Crow laws, segregation, practices such as redlining that prevented Black people from buying houses in certain neighborhoods. And 
you have that, like we've already discussed, where you have a kid going off to college who doesn't have that set up early on in life. And then maybe as they do start to earn these high paying jobs, they then want to go back and help their family. They want to go back then and help other people because they know that they're the one or two out of their family or peer group that has made it. So now they have to reach back and bring other people. I feel privileged to be able to do that for other people, but it is a it could be a burden at the same time because you're trying to build this future for your own family and for your own kids, paying back the debt that you borrowed. But then you may have parents and grandparents that are going to need financial help as well. And so I think that my part as a content creator is to continue to raise awareness, continue to let people know that all of us do not start from the same the same place. You know, we do not all start out having parents that have money to leave to us. I mean, one example in, in my real life is when my husband and I first got married, we started working with a financial planner early on in our marriage, which I was uh, blessed to be able to, to do that. I, I think that's one of the best moves we made, especially early on when we weren't necessarily as financially literate as we are now, we needed some additional help. And we had some friends while he was in graduate school that said, hey, this is our financial planner, Scott, why don't you you sit down and talk to Scott? So we did that. And then a couple of years into it, we were trying to figure out how we were going to buy a house. And we sat down with Scott, we talked about what we have saved, what we got in retirement accounts versus savings and this, that, and a third. And Scott, who is a Caucasian male, he's our financial planner. He says, so... Eric and Nicole, do you do your parents have money set aside for you for a down payment for a house or grandparents? And my husband and I literally looked at each other and bust out laughing at the same time. It's like, <laughs> Scott, that is not a thing where we are from. That's not a thing. I don't know anybody who had parents that, you know, had black families who had that kind of wealth. Not to say that there aren't, but we didn't know anybody like that. Yeah. And we certainly didn't come from families that were that way. And Neither of my parents ever owned a house to this day. You know, my dad passed away some years ago, but my mom to this day has never owned a house. She probably won't won't be listening to. I know she watches my channel, so I've never said this on my channel, but um, I don't know if she listens to podcasts. But one of my goals is to be able to hand her the keys to a house one day and say, wow. Mom, here are the keys. You ain't got to worry no more. Here are the keys. So, you know, I feel like that's my burden as her child because she sacrificed so much to get me to this point where I am today. I owe her that. And to see my grandmother literally have tears in her eyes when we when we bought this house that we live in now, because she she never thought that that would be possible, that somebody that came from her, one of her grandchildren could be in this type of neighborhood and have these types of opportunities. So, I mean, yes, those are the types of things. So I feel like I need to raise awareness of this, you know, this thing that is called white privilege, especially among my fellow uh, content creators in personal finance, because you do have minority people listening to your shows, guys. You have uh, minorities reading your blogs and not everybody is going to start from the same point. So raising awareness, continuing to put out content related to financial literacy, meeting people where they are. Serving as an example myself, uh, working on mindset and also focusing more on ownership versus consumerism, which I think is is a big thing in minority communities as well. Man, that's so good. I mean, so like, I think another thing is you got to call out like policies that like people think are progressive, but they're not. Do you know what I mean? Like, so like widespread student loan forgiveness, it seems like the most progressive thing, but then like you're going to give really most of that benefit to people that have the three, four or $500,000 debts, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you look at the worst part of the student loan problem, uh, in terms of like credit score relative to like per dollar problems, it's like basically in like the African-American community, it's like this college completion crisis. Like I was like doing some reading about it. And like, if you took like a relatively small amount of money, you could like literally pay off all of that debt that's like hurting people's credit scores, causing them to get worse interest rates on their mortgages, you know, on their car loans, et cetera. That's like further making sure they're stuck in poverty, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about like multi-trillion dollar problem when it's like, hey, if you care about the racial wealth gap, like you could close a whole lot of it without a lot of effort. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely, I agree. And like there's like the NYU thing too, because like, you know, most of the people who have lots and lots of money are old white men you know, founder of Home Depot donated enough money to make tuition free at NYU and, you know, good for him. Like, but they were calling out like the, one of the reasons they wanted to do it was to make it easier for underrepresented students and students of color to get into medicine. And I'm like, 
please. <laughs> like, like they did it because like somebody wanted their name in a medical school and also they're wanting to raise all of their scores and, and things like by like having free, you know, tuition, they're going to have all these people applying with perfect scores. Right. And so you're not going to do that much to like attract communities of color that didn't have private MCAT tutors, you mm-hmm. know, paid for by their parents. I don't know. I, just, I was just kind of like floored when I did that math with like HBCUs versus like Biden's plan to like, you know, forgive all public college tech. Cause it's like, it's like this list of stuff. And you wouldn't think that like the HBCU part of the plank would only cost $2 billion, but the public college part would cost like 50 times that. I mean, I, I I had never heard that, you know, that part of his plan. So, I mean, I'm intrigued by that, but I think that that would go a long way towards facilitating more professionals out in the workforce that have the resources. They come from, you know, these academic institutions that have resources. I think that's part of the reason why, specifically in my profession, where you have so many HBCUs that are still out here that don't have professional PA programs because they don't have the proper facilities set up where they don't have the resources to attract faculty by paying them what they deserve. And you have all of these other things that can lead to decline of programs over time. And it's just like, we need that pipeline. We need to have those pipelines available so that we can continue to diversify professions and especially in healthcare. Yeah. Well, it definitely doesn't happen unless you have the conversations. So a couple more questions. How did you become a professional YouTuber? Am I a professional YouTuber? <laughs> well, I feel like you're professional compared to me. I'm, I'm like a guy with a webcam that throws a couple of videos up there. I mean, you know, some people at Studio Loan Planner have accidentally found our YouTube channel, but I feel like <laughs> it's, uh, I guess I'm a lot better at just like randomly talking uh, without having to worry about my face. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, um, what has been your, uh, you know, your, your journey, I guess, of becoming like a, how about like YouTube is your side hustle? Yeah. So it really evolved out of me wanting to share my my experiences and coming up with a plan to get my finances together and pay back the student loan debt that I had. So once I, like I mentioned, that third degree that I had, that third college degree, I was six months pregnant with my second child when I finished that degree. And I was thinking to myself, I need to figure out how much money I owe in student loans because I had deferred undergrad, had deferred master's during the master's degree, and then, you know, all through the doctorate, what have you. So pretty much in my mind, that money, that student loans that I owe, that didn't even exist. But now it's real. Like finishing that final degree, I knew I was done with school. No more deferments. You got to figure out how to pay this stuff back. So I started like YouTube and stuff and Google and stuff and trying to figure out how to do my budget and ways to cut costs. And I was watching these videos, like this whole debt-free community before they called it debt-free community. I was watching on YouTube. And one day I decided, you know what, I'm going to start my own channel. And I started with my webcam, Travis. I sat down (laughs) and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to make a video. I'm going to talk about what I'm planning to do and why I want to pay back this debt. And here I am five years later. That's pretty much what happened. (laughs) Wow. Well, that's pretty cool. And, uh, And also Frugal Chic Life is the name of your YouTube channel, right? So if they want to type in that into YouTube, they can subscribe, right? And then yes. if you go to frugalchiclife.com, then they can find out more about, about you and your tips. And I watch the videos. You're, I understand why you have like 10x the subscribers on YouTube that I do. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> you get better over time. I just I just was winging it. And then, uh, and then all of a sudden, I got into a little bit of a groove. People started watching and subscribing. And, and I have some people that have been with me the whole five years from video number one. Wow. Wow. We've talked about a little bit about where people can find about you, but, but, you know, how can people contact you or, or, you know, send you a message or like, you know, is there any particular place that they should start in your website? Like, you know, where can people learn more about you, Nicole? I'd say just go right to frugalchiclife.com and you'll be directed from there. There's a start here page. If you want to learn more about me, all of my contact information, links to my YouTube channel. I have a little baby podcast that I recently started too. Um, also the Frugal Chic Life podcast. So anywhere Frugal Chic Life online, you're going to find me. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Nicole, for being on the show. And uh, thank you so much for you know adding your voice to just really important conversations. Oh, thank you so much, Travis. I appreciate the opportunity.